Okay. It's nice to be back here again. It's, uh, as Bab mentioned, I have had the honor to be able to present here multiple times and was, was very thrilled when the phone rang and actually the uh, email came in the other day and asked would I be available to come and give a talk today. And, and I thought, well, what would be, would be great to talk about? And I thought, well, spring's on the way. And spring is here, believe it or not. <laughs> Doesn't feel like it, I know, but spring is here. Just, just ask the wildlife, it's out there. Um, certainly early blooming things like hepaticas have already began to bloom, but you know, sometimes we'll, we'll see those even in December. But now we're starting to see things like trout lilies in bloom. And when we see the trout lilies, oh yeah, trout lilies are already starting to bloom and they'll begin and they'll, they'll continue to bloom on probably for about another month depending upon the elevation you're at. That's one of the wonderful things about living in the Carolinas is we have so much elevation change. So if you happen to miss something in bloom at 1,000 feet, just wait two weeks and go to 2,000 feet. And if you miss it then, go to 3,000 feet, which is what I used to do when, before we had wonderful digital photography when we would shoot 35 millimeter film, you know, you'd go take all these photographs and you'd go back and you'd get them developed and you'd look at them and you're like, oh, that is not what I wanted. So, okay, next week I have to go up a thousand feet in elevation because they'll be in bloom there. Well, it turns out there are a lot of plant animals that do that and it is temperature dependent. Sort of as a rule of thumb about every feet you go up in elevation, the temperature is going to drop about three degrees Fahrenheit. And for plants, that makes a huge difference because it's not only the length of daylight, but it's also that soil temperature to trigger them when it's time to begin to bloom, when it's time to begin to emerge out of the ground. And certainly things like trilliums, which are our early spring ephemerals, which means they're short-lived, they're only up for a little while. Although, I'm going to talk about this in just a little while, they may erroneously be in the wrong family because the family they're grouped into does something very different from these that have to do with their longevity. And we'll talk about that in just a little while. Um, trilliums are one of the, the plants, like many people who are interested in botany, that, that caught my attention early on. Um, unfortunately, it was not my grandmother who took me out into the forest, a wonderful woman. And, and to her, and, and I've told this story before, to her, a bluebird was a bluebird. It doesn't matter if it was an eastern bluebird, a blue jay, an indigo bunting. It didn't matter. A bluebird's a bluebird. A flower's a flower. Um, however, I was very fortunate to have a dad um, who loved to camp and to fish. And so he took me out in the woods and, and just let me go out and explore. And I would fish for a little while, but young, I was like, yeah, I don't know if I want to fish all of them. I'm getting a little bored. So I'd start turning over rocks. And as I'm turning over rocks, I would notice this flower was in bloom along the stream bank. And that's what really you know, captured my interest in, in terms of the natural world. Um, I am a botanist by training, but I did find out later on that there's all these bugs on my plants. <laughs> so what is this bug and what's it doing on there and what's the connections? And as we turned out, as you look closely, you'll find that everything out there is connected. And that's true of Trillium as well. So what I'm going to share with you today is a little bit about Trillium of the Carolinas. And this particular topic and this particular flower is one of great interest because if you look at all of the light green, those are all places in which trillium occur. All right, so if you take North America, look at pretty much the whole eastern part of North America is just covered with trillium. And the, the trillium genus, the, the scientific group in which they fall in, the greatest diversity of trilliums in the world is here in North America. And even better than that for us, the greatest diversity of trilliums in North America is in the eastern United States, specifically the southeast. Now this may kind of throw you off just a little bit because, well, it does show you there's a lot of green up and through here. That just means there's trillium there. But when you get down into places like along this drainage right along the borders of South Carolina and Georgia, the Savannah River drainage basin, depending upon who you ask, there's somewhere between 25 and 30 species, and many of them only occur in the Savannah River drainage. Wonder why. So why do we have so much diversity here in the Carolinas and the eastern United States? Kind of goes back to what I mentioned earlier. It's because of the topography. And because of that topography, our climate is very different. If you're here in the mountains of the Carolinas, you can go to the high points at over 6,000 feet of Mount Mitchell and see wonderful things like painted trilliums in bloom. But you can go to the Piedmont of South Carolina, and throughout the Piedmont, you're going to find wonderful things like Catesby's trillium, our most common trillium in the, 
throughout Carolinas and Georgia. Um, but even all the way down to the coast of the Carolinas, you're going to find trillium. As a matter of fact, some of our trillium species only occur today along the coast, in the coastal zone and in the coastal plains. However, if you look back in time and you begin to look at some of the pollen record and looking at where these things once occurred, they actually had a much more wide distribution. So why would things occur on the coast, but they no longer occur in the mountains? Or even better, why would you find a species that occurs in the mountains and many of them grow all the way down into the Piedmont and some of their very close cousins, turns out very closely related genetically, show up on the coast? It all has to do with how plants move. Yes, plants do move. We don't think about plants moving, do we? We think about animals moving. We think about animal migration. Plants migrate as well. They just do it a lot slower. Okay? So as Rudy Mankey, and many of you may know Rudy Mankey or heard the name Rudy Mankey, I always like to, he has this quote which I think is just perfect. Every species can grow everywhere. Think about that. Every species can grow everywhere. As long as it can do these three things. It can get there. Once it gets there, it can survive. <laughs> and third, and most importantly for us within Southern Appalachia, once it gets there, it doesn't change into something else. Think about islands in the skies, these tops of these mountains. Many times these plant and animal populations were all contiguous. But then as glaciation continues to, basically we're coming out of an ice age, as we continue to warm coming out of that last ice age, things get pushed to the tops of the mountains. So now these individuals, all of the same species, well, they can't all sexually reproduce with all the others they used to. So it turns out their traits start to be a little more pronounced. And over time, lo well and behold, you have a whole new species. And that has happened in many different plants and animals. So the greatest diversity of trilliums on the planet within southern Appalachia and within the southeastern United States, and it has to do with that topography. Getting there, surviving once you're there, and then not changing into something else once you're there. But if you do, well, you just have a new species. I'm going to show you a new one today. So how do you move if you're a plant? And why do plants flower? Do, do all plants flower? I know it's early on Saturday. No. <laughs> so I'd also tell you, for those of you who've never heard me present before, I, I was also a, a teacher for a while. And so a lot of times I do ask questions. And, and I'll get people look at me like, he asked me a question. Are we supposed to respond? <laughs> if you know the answer, it's OK. But if you don't, th th then that's OK as well, because that's what I'm here for today. Um, Plants flower, and those that do flower, those that don't flower are things like ferns and mosses. Still plants, but they don't flower. They reproduce a different way. So wh why does a plant that flowers expend all of that energy to make a flower? It is extremely energy demanding to put on a flower. It's to attract pollinators. Because essentially, if you're going to move around, the way you're going to move around as a plant is one of two ways. One of those ways is through sexual reproduction. So it's to attract these pollinators, and trillium do the same thing. One of the trillium pollinators is this guy right here in the middle. You might recognize him by the elytra on the back. That's the hard wings that are covering soft wings, letting us know this is a coleopteran, a beetle. Now, there are different species of trillium, and different species of trillium have different pollinators. Okay, but one type of pollinator of trilliums are going to be the coleopterans or the beetles. Another is going to be the hymenopterans. Hymen being thin tissue wing. These are the hymenopterans. These are things like bees and wasp. Okay, so they're going to come in. And you can see this visiting down inside of here, and it's just coming back out. It came for nectar, but it came back out covered with pollen, and it's going to take that pollen and, of course, go to another trillium and leave that, and then we're going to have cross-pollination. But guess what? Some trilliums don't have nectar. It's one of those great trickeries of plants to entice a pollinator to come in, 
with the thoughts that it's going to come in and get a nice sugary meal of nectar. Gets there, lo and behold, it got nothing to eat, but still it leaves covered with pollen. And many different plants do that as well, and some trillium species do that. It's usually the ones that are pretty stinky. It gives you an idea who might come to them. Stinky plants usually attract flies and beetles. Okay? So we've got um, beetle pollinators, we've got hominopterans. We also have this lady. This is a queen bumblebee. Bumblebees are pollinators specifically of one of our large white showy trillium, which we'll see in just a little while. So they're going to come in, they're going to collect that pollen, they're going to take that pollen. And, and how far is a, a beetle or a yellow jacket or a bumblebee, how far are they going to go? Hundreds of miles? No, they got a pretty limited range. So what do you think that might mean in terms of the trillium population? Do you think that particular species is going to be widely spread? No. Okay? Because those pollinators are not going to be moving that pollen any great distance, so hence you're not going to get seed production. But if you get seed production, now you've got to move that seed around. Or we said you got to get there first to be able to exist there. Well, how do you move your seeds around if you are a trillium? Well, trillium and other species that we have of flowering early spring ephemerals will produce on a seed this nice lipid rich packet. It's not to feed the new trillium, it's to entice the ant to come over, pick up the seed, carry it back. They carry it down in the ground. And what they're going to do is they're going to eat this eliosome off of there. If they eat that eliosome off of there, then they're going to leave the seed. Now the seed's under the ground. What do we call that if you plant a seed? <laughs> yeah, there you go. You're going to grow a plant. Well, how about ants? How far is an ant going to disperse a seed? Not very far. If it shows up to your kitchen, it might pick it up, yeah. But the seed dispersal is not very far for a trillium. And most of our trillium species, the major seed disperser is going to be the formicity. That's the family of ants. And there are different types of ants that do this. Okay. Um, there are also some other animals that love this eliosome. The seeds are too heavy to be wind dispersed. Good question, though. Seed dispersal in trillium and many other plants is by animal. Sometimes it can be by water. Um, others that have lighter seeds can be carried by the wind. So we know this ant's not going very far. Um, some early research that was done indicates that on average, uh, probably the greatest distance is about 2.4 meters. If you multiply that by 39 inches, that gives you roughly about what, seven point something feet. So less than eight feet away from where this ant picked it up, it's going to carry it. Not very far, right? All right. But there are other things that are attracted to this nice lipid rich. Yellow jackets. Yellow jackets come in. This is a big fruit off of a trillium. There are the seeds. See that nice eliosome on there? They're going to come in and they are going to carry that seed. They're going to disperse it. They can go further. Um, some work um, back in the early 2000s by uh, Larry Zettler and Tim Spira. You guys may know Tim Spira. Um, I think he came here and spoke a couple of times, or at least once. Um, two great books he has out there, if you haven't seen those. Um, great books. But Zettler and Spira did some work in the early 2000s, and they found out that, lo and behold, these yellow jackets could disperse the seeds further than ants. Well, makes sense, right? Should be able to. But we didn't know that. Turns out about 20 meters, almost 10 times the distance, so roughly 80 feet away. But that's still not very far, is it? So now you have this thing that the pollinators are only going to fly a certain distance. Now your seed disperser is not going to go that far. It becomes a little easier to understand why they are isolated to certain locales. There's one trillium called the Watery from the Watery River. The Watery trillium only occurs in one locale on the planet Earth. One small location on one 
section of the Watery River. It's on private property. I'd tell you where it is. I have permission to tell you that it exists, but I can't take you there. No birds. Nope. No birds. No. But turns out there are some vertebrates that will move them around. Mr. Whitetail Deer. <laughs> now, Whitetail deer love to eat plants. They love, especially, you know, nice soft succulents. Anybody ever, anybody have deer that like to eat your plants? No, of course not. Of course not. No. People ask me, so what kind of plant the deer won't eat? Nothing. <laughs> well, what's your goal for your garden? I like to feed the birds. Put in a metal pole and bird seed. That, that'll, you'll be okay. Well, and actually, there's been a lot of research done by, um, over at Wofford University, Doug Rayner. You may know the name Doug Rayner from South Carolina Wildflowers or Wildflowers of South Carolina. Um, Doug Rayner has done a lot of work in Spartanburg County where he built these huge exclosures where the deer couldn't get in and monitored overall population size and distribution within there. Here's a tough one. Where do you think there were more plants? Inside where the deer couldn't get or outside where the deer could get? Yeah, now you guys are waking up. Yeah, yeah, more, more on the inside. There was an area, and this was over in, in, in Georgia, just across the Savannah River, that there was a huge population of trillium. And as we would expect, that trillium of population really was not moving that far. But then all of a sudden, they appeared miles away from that population where they had never been growing before. So how did they get there? Certainly not an ant. Not a yellow jacket, because yellow jackets, you know, not very far, about 80 feet or so. They began to look into the scat. That's the scientific name for animal poop. The scat. And they were finding trillium seeds. So, remember that first thing, you've got to get there. You've got to be pollinated, you've got to make a seed, and you've got to move around. Now, there are other things that will feed upon these eliosomes, this lipid fatty material that's on there. Um, things like slugs. Turns out the slugs don't disperse the seed. They'll eat the nice little meal packet that's on there for them, the elisome, but then they eat it. So slugs aren't really good at dispersing them. They just eat them and, and, and then head on their way. Now, I mentioned to you that there's two ways of moving if you were a trillium or any plant. One way is by sexual reproduction, by getting cross-pollinated or even pollinating yourself, producing a seed, and that seed gets dispersed. But another way is through asexual reproduction. This is on a rhizome. A rhizome is part of the root structure of the plant. And what happens on that rhizome, you can have a new trillium plant to come off of that plant. And what will happen is it will grow out, and then lo and behold, right beside it, a new plant will come up. And then over time, this section where it was connected will rot. Okay? So you can see them spreading asexually through basically coming off of that rhizome. So genetically it's the same as the parent material that it came off of, but that's another way of moving around. Either way, whether you are seed dispersed through the steps of, of sexual reproduction or if it's asexual reproduction and you're coming off of here, either way if you were a trillium it takes you two years before you ever pop up out of the ground. But it's only the beginning of your journey because trillium can live more than 75 years. You want a plant that you don't have to replant? Keep the deer away. Okay? 75 years. It's like getting a parrot. You got to leave that trillium to somebody, okay? Scientists know 75 years, but it could be longer. Because what happens is if you see these little arrows that are on here, you'll see there's a little fleshy ring on here. That's the new growth. So you're going to get a little fleshy green. It's going to come off, but then they start to rot. So you can go back and kind of like counting the rings in the tree, but not exactly. You can count the segments and get an idea how old that trillium is. And many of the trillium that you see out there, particularly in huge, huge populations, if you get into some of those areas where those plants have been there, you're going to have trillium that are 50, 60, as much as 75 years. But remember, when it first starts out, two years before it ever comes out of the ground. But potentially, for 75 more years or longer, you're going to have that plant. And when it comes out of the ground, there you have it, the beautiful trillium. They recognize that as a trillium? 
It's missing some stuff. This is a, a, a unilum, I guess. It's certainly not a trillium, but it is a trillium. It takes from five to seven years, depending on the species, for a trillium to have all of its parts of three, three leaves, three petals, three sepals, and to produce a flower. As much as seven years from a seed to a flower. So it's going to take a while, but remember, you may have this plant for a long time. Okay? Now, remember I mentioned this thing about they're kind of like lilies. I mentioned they were ephemeral, which means they're short-lived. Anybody have lilies at home? Or know somebody who has lilies? Mm -hmm. Day lilies. Okay, they come up. Lots of lilies. So what happens when you have a lily comes up? The lily comes up. It produces a flower. Then shortly after the flower is produced, what happens to the leaves? They start to die, don't they? They start to become yellow. They begin to die back. And they start looking pretty ratty. And I know a lot of times people go back and they'll ball them up and put a rubber band around them so they don't look so bad out there, all these dead leaves. But you don't want to trim them because they're still using those. But they don't usually hold on to that foliage until time to it produces a fruit. Trillium do. As a matter of fact, some trillium species, if they are pollinated and they're going to produce a fruit, they will continue to photosynthesize and not only store energy in that root, which they can use for next year, but they will also store energy in the form of carbohydrates. That's what you do with photosynthesis. You make carbohydrates. It will store it in the leaf material. And it's going to use that leaf material to help feed that plant because that plant has to be able to provide all the nutrients and development to make that fruit. So it's not only got to make the fruit, it's got to make the seed, it's got to pack lunch, the elisome for the seed dispersers, and also in that seed it's got to pack lunch for the future trillium. Lots and lots of energy. So that doesn't fit into lilies. There's lots of other things. So what you might find is instead of it being in the family Liliaceae, they're in the Trilliaceae family. Now this isn't really that huge of a jump. Because if you look back in 1827, a French botanist, Francois, named the Trilliaceae family. But for years and years, folks have used the Trilliaceae, or the Liliaceae, I should say, and not Trilliaceae for the family name. But it's coming back around again. Um, Weekly's flora out of, in, out of North Carolina, which is probably the, the newest, it has the most current information. If you're not familiar with Weekly's, it's not like picking up a wildflower book that you go through and there's lots of color photographs. Oh no, the book's about this thick. Um, if you're familiar with Radford and Bell from the 60s, um, it's kind of one of those books. But in Weekly's flora, it's the Trilliaceae family. Okay? There are six genera, but the southeast United States contains only the genus Trillium, which we talked about a little bit, okay? All right, this is one of my favorite ones. I'm going to read it to you. This genus is an interesting one. Under great simplicity and conformity of habit, three leaves at the summit of a stem, supporting one solitary terminal flower. It contains and conceals many species. 1817 botanist Stephen Elliott. That one little paragraph says a whole lot. It gives you an idea that three leaves, it lets you know where they occur. It lets you know that it has a solitary terminal flower. But most importantly, this genus conceals many different species. And what we're going to do, we're going to spend the rest of our time looking at these different species. I'm going to share with you a little bit about their distribution, where you can go and see them, but also a little bit about how to identify them. All right? Anybody have any questions so far? This will be on the quiz. <laughs> Essay, Trillium Dispersal, okay?
All right. Well, remember he said everything's in parts of threes, right? And, and there we go. We're gonna, here's a nice little trillium. This is a typical flower. You've got this nice showy, this is called the petal. Behind it, these are the sepals. Out here in the middle, you've got the carpal, which is in the middle. And then you've got these elongated structures right here, which are called the stamen. That's going to be important, particularly these petals, sepals, and that stamen, because stamen's going to help you out a lot. See that word right there, that last part, M-E-N? That's the male part of the plant. Okay? That's the male part. And when we start identifying trillium, the length of the stamen is going to tell you of the arrangement. That's going to tell you a little bit about how to identify it because color won't work every time. Okay? So that's the general layout. So everything's in parts of threes, as Elliot said. All right. Now let's look at an actual flower itself. So here we go. We've got everything in threes again. So here we go. We've got three petals. Remember, that's the showy part. We've got three sepals, the green parts back in here. Then we've got the carpal in through here, and then we've got these nice yellow stamen. That's the guy part, the male part. This dark center down here, that's the fem part of the female part. That's the ovary. Okay? Um, up in the very top, this is called the stigma, which is where the pollen gets attached. And basically, where I'm going with this is ovary color can help well. Okay? So basic stuff. Everything's in threes, right? What's up with this one then? Lo and behold, what do we got going on here? We have a double trillium. But notice it still only has one flower, but everything down below is, there is basically this top part has been added onto it. If you could see underneath there, this trillium luteum or yellow trillium would have three sepals underneath there as well. And look here beside, here's a young one. Didn't go far from the plant, did it? There's another one over here, another one over here. Um, this is in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Um, but you can find trillium in multiples in lots of places. The key is you've got to find a big population. And you get a huge population, it's like any other species. The greater the number in your population, the greater the chance you're going to have individual characteristics that begin to show up. Okay? You know, everybody's an individual. They're going to look a little bit different from the other ones. Do you know where the Devil's Courthouse is on the Blue Ridge Parkway? Great place to go see painted trilliums. A, it's high elevation, which we're going to find out in a little while is important for painted trillium. You're not going to find those at low elevations unless somebody was very successful in transplanting probably the most difficult trillium to move or to plant. Please don't move them, but to buy and transplant. Um, but you go there, and they're in parts of twos and fours and sixes. Well, that's a multiple of three, so that kind of works. But there are so many there that you will see a lot of different individual characteristics beginning to pop out. Okay? So it's not always as simple as everything's in parts of three. But it's a good place to start. Okay? Now, where is the flower located? That's the next thing. Within Trillium, nice thing about it, all those different species that are out there fall into one or two groups. And it has to do with where your flower is located. In this case, if you come up the stem, here are the petals and the sepals. There is no petiole. And there was a little stem that, for the flower, a little stalk. It's called a petiole. So since there is not one, this botan the botanical word for that is sessel. So easily enough, we call these the sessel trilliums. There you go, the sessel trilliums. And then our other group are going to be those that do have a pedicel and they hang down, the leaf's up above it. This one is hanging down, so they are the nodding trillium. So the sessile trilliums and the nodding trilliums. So the first thing you're gonna look for on that plant, and usually it's gonna be in parts of threes, if it has a flower, you're going to look to see if the flower is born on the very top and it's sessile, or if that flower is hanging down on a pedestal, it's gonna be nodding. Be careful though, those part to threes will get you. I've had many, many people walk up to me and say, what kind of trillium is this? And I'll go, Arisima trifilum. <laughs> Jack in the pulpit. Jack in the pulpit has three. It, it's, it's called, you know, the name lets you know that it's got three uh, components of the leaf. But remember with 
with trillium, they're all going to come off from each other um, symmetrically. So you're going to have, I don't have three hands. Come here, be my third hand. <laughs> Hold your hand up high. There you go. One, two, three. All right, we got three. Okay, so they're all kind of, but if you get a jack in the pulpit, it's kind of like this. Trillium. Jack in the pulpit. Okay, good. Got it. All right, then look for where the flower is, okay? All right, so here we go. We're ready. Let's look at who it's out here. This is one that most probably had the opportunity to see. This is the sweet Betsy Trillium, Trillium cuneatum. Got parts of threes. Notice it's got a nice burgundy um, um, petals on there. It's mottled. The leaves are mottled in coloration. And the name implies that it has a sweet smell, and it does. In some populations, more than others. It's almost like a sweet banana flavor to, or aroma to me. Never eaten one, but it's a sort of sweet banana. Um, and these things, where they grow, you will get huge, huge, huge populations of them. Okay. And, of course, when you get huge populations of them, you're going to get some individuals who want to be a little bit different. Same genus, same species. Trillium uniatum, Mountain Sweet Betsy, but look at the color. It's not burgundy anymore. But you can barely tell if you look through there. It's kind of dark in the middle. It's still going to have that dark colored ovary. Okay. Um, this particular, these two plants were photographed at Station Cove Falls. Um, and I understand Pat's going to be doing a hike there on April. I want to say it's tax day, believe it or not, like April 15th for some reason. <laughs> what a great way to celebrate tax day. Mid-April, Pam can let you know when that's going to be, um, but PAC's going to be leading a hike over there. It's a great time to go because you're going to see thousands of Trillium cuneatum, and you will probably see some green ones in there as well. Um, but it's also a great time to be there because there are two other species that occur there, and you'd be able to see them there as well. Um, also, you can go to Pearson's Falls. Pearson's Falls has... Um, Mountain Sweet Betsy Trillium, along with some other species as well. Um, they, they grow in lots of locales. They're going to grow uh, nine times preserve over along Highway 11. Uh, lots of places you can see this particular one. It's, it's fairly widely spread okay, in the mountainous areas. Okay. But look at this one. How do we know this one is not a cuneatum. How do we know this is yellow trillium? Well, it's yellow, but hang on. Look at that. Look at that. Let's look inside. If you look inside, the yellow, we're not going to be able to see it in this case, um, but yeah, the, the, the ovary is a different color. Okay? Um, it can be a different coloration in there. Also, it won't have that sweet smell to it. But there are other yellow trilliums as well, which kind of throw you off, which is where I was headed with the next one. This is faded trillium. And faded trillium can be anywhere from a whitish coloration to a yellow coloration, but it is our only sessile trillium with spoon-shaped petals. So here we go. It's real narrow at the bottom, and it comes out like a spoon or a spatula. Got those dark-colored stamen inside of here. There's a dark ovary. Everything in there is sort of a dark maroon color. What you're going to see out here is you're going to see that spoon-shaped petal. But the leaves look very much the same as any of those other species that we've seen so far, and more that we're going to see. This is Trillium discolor. If you look inside a Trillium discolor, look at the anthers, and look at the stamens. We'll stay with that part, the stamens right in through here. Very different coloration than the ones we saw before. So coloration of the stamens are one of the things that can help you. Ah, the relic trillium. Trillium reliquum. Well, look at this. Nice and burgundy like when we saw earlier, the Mountain Sweet Betsy. So we need to do a little closer investigation and we look inside. Looks very different. Still has a dark ovary in there, but look at the outlines of these stamens. It's going to have that dark purple, but you're going to have the yellow coloration along the sides. It's going to have that yellow pollen associated with it as well. Okay? But also, most importantly, if you look at these stamens, look how they go above and over, and they cover that ovary. That's one of the characteristics. If you look inside of a sessile 
burgundy colored trillium. And you've got those fingers covering up over it, look like little fingers, little stamen coming up over it, and that ovary's hidden. Yeah, then you've got relic trillium. How does it get pollinated other than self pollinate? Uh, well, it can self pollinate, but also um, insects can be quite creative. They can find their ways. It's not completely enclosed. If you see, there is openings. So there's an opening, there's an opening. So they can actually make its way inside of it. Okay, they can get in there. All right, we've got lance leaf trillium, and the name is quite nice. Look, these are long lance shaped leaves, but also look at that petiole, or excuse me, look at that uh, sepal. No petiole on this one, it's still sessile, but look at that. Nice elongated lance shape. This is lance leaf trillium. Mmm, that looks just like the other one. Look at that, that's a lance leaf. Look at that. Looks a lot alike, doesn't it? Yeah. This is model trillium, trillium maculatum. One of the easiest ways for this one is location. <coughs> Relic trillium grows in very few places, and it's going to be more in the upcountry. This is a coastal species for the most part. Um, this was taken off the coast of South Carolina on um, Spring Island, just outside of Beaufort. Um, Beautiful, beautiful plant, Trillium maculatum. And they also, look at the size of this. If I showed you this picture, is that tropical or subtropical? That's definitely not the mountains, is it? Yeah. Yeah, got palmettos in the background. Beautiful population. I'm trying to, oh, something, oh, look at that. What's that blooming in there? Sneaking in on the Trillium slideshow. Sanguinaria, bloodroot. Yeah. Atabasco lilies were also blooming at the same time. It was quite magical. I was very fortunate to be there at that time. Um, but, but coastal once again. Ah, now, we're going to move to a whole new group. There are more sessile trilliums than you saw, but I gave you sort of a good scattering of what's going to be out through there. So we're going to move on to some of the nodding trilliums. This is our most common nodding trillium. This is Catesby's trillium, named after Mark Catesby, one of the early naturalists who came through the Carolinas. Um, it's got a nice, you can see it's underneath. Here are our petals. The flower is nodding underneath there. And almost every photograph you see of a Catesby trillium is going to be this nice blush pink color. But when they first open up, there's pure white. When they first open, Catesby's trilliums are white. White is all the colors of the rainbow. If you came to my talk on pollinators here a number of years ago, that's a very important trait to have. Because if you are white, you are all the colors in the rainbow, which means you are visible by anything that can see color in this light spectrum, the, the visible light, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. So that means you can be seen by lots of things. Why does a flower want to be seen? So it gets pollinated, right? Well, once you've been pollinated, do you want any need to attract the pollinator? No. So once you've been kissed, you blush. <laughs> oh, this one has been pollinated. This one is blushing. Yeah. Now, sometimes they will just fade with, with age. They don't necessarily get pollinated. But chemically, what happens in here is this plant gets to a certain, once it's pollinated, then chemically it's going to change and it's going to signal to that plant, okay, reduce out of pigment. So if you're no longer producing all those pigments, which requires energy, you stop producing those pigments, you no longer are white in color. Therefore, you begin to change and you go to a different coloration. But also with age, what happens with that is you are no longer producing those photosynthetic pigments or even those pigments to attract a pollinator. So this one's been pollinated, or it's very old, probably been pollinated. Though. And there's ways you can find out as well. Oh, this one is awesome. Weeks and weeks that thing will be in bloom. It is great. The great thing about Catesby's trilliums is they're widely distributed. You're going to find them in the mountains. You're going to find them in the Piedmont. Um, they, they cover uh, almost to the Sand Hills region. It is widely distributed and they bloom for so long. 
And this one, depending, but they'll go from this almost to, they'll go white to pink to almost this incredible, uh, what's the color? I, I'm, I'm going to be a, I'm gonna be a guy here. Um, it's, it's reddish, pinkish, purplish kind of color. Mauve. There you go. We'll go to mauve. Yeah. So I've seen a mauve in May before. <laughs> I should better remember that now. Okay. All right. So we got the KHB down, right? And this is trillium KHBI. It's a nodding trillium, white. Then it begins to fade. Okay. So what's this one? Is that a KHBs? No. Can't be. It's sticking straight up above, right? Well, so what is it? It does look somewhat grandiflorum, uh, but not quite. That's a good one. I can't tell you its name because it doesn't have one yet. Right now we call it the Jones Gap Trillium. Guess where it grows? <laughs> Jones Gap State Park. It's the only place in the world it's known to grow. It is not a new species yet. It may turn out to be a variety. But remember, you got to get there. You got to be able to survive. And you don't change into something once you get there, this thing is changing into something else. The entire population, even though it does have a pedestal, all of them are above. I've never seen, out of thousands and thousands of them, looking at them for 20 years or more, never seen one that was nodding. They bloom earlier. So if you're not blooming at the same time those ones that are Catesby's bloom, you can't, you can't cross-pollinate. So these are going to be pollinating each other, so their characteristics are going to carry on. So if nothing else, we can tell you it's Trillium, Catesby, Variation, whatever it's going to be called. Um, Dr. Patrick McMillan and some other folks are looking at it right now, trying to decide if it's going to be its own new species or not. Okay? Are they widespread in Jones Gap? Oh yeah, go do the Jones Gap Trail. You do, you're doing Jones Gap this year? Yesterday. Yesterday. When? Yesterday. When? Are they there? Tax day. Remember April 15th? We were there on Thursday. Yeah, April, usually about April 17th, plus or minus a couple of days, there's a lot of stuff in bloom. That's what I shoot for because you'll get Sweet Betsy's, you'll get Case Bees, and you'll get our largest flowering nodding trillium, Vassii. So from the 17th on, you'll get lots of, lots of them. But they're throughout. They're throughout. Along the Jones Gap Trail is the best place to see them. About a half mile in and just keep going. We are doing oil camp. Oh, okay, oil camp, yeah, they're not in oil camp. They're not. Um, some incredible trout lilies in there, though, I hear. How do you decide it's a new species? Do you look at DNA or anything like that? Or? Yeah, it's DNA. Yeah, so that, that's why folks who have those credentials, and if you're going to come out and say that it's a new species, you have to. It looks like this, How do you, and, and then I'll make the decision. So that's why folks like that are doing that. But someday, but for now, we just call it the Jones Gap Trillium. And you can Google it, Jones Gap Trillium, and it'll pop up. There's lots of folks who like to check it out. Okay. Ah, now this is probably one of our, in South Carolina, it's one of our more rare species. It's called the painted trillium. It looks as if someone has painted it in the middle right there. It's trillium undulatum. Undulate means wavy. And if you look at the edge of the petals on the flower, particularly this lower one, they're real wavy. So that's why it's called Trillium undulatum. Okay? And if we look a little closer at it, you can really see it. Painted Trillium because it looked as if someone has came in and painted these inverted V's. I have seen the V's going the other direction before, though. Huge population of them. Our painted trilliums are trillium species that grow at higher elevations. And in South Carolina, we don't have a lot of high elevation. There are two known populations of painted trillium today in South Carolina. Um, one's in Greenville County, one is in Oconee County, and they both occur at a little over 3,000 feet above sea level, but because of all of the topography aspect, all the other conditions, it's what you'd expect to find at 4,000. Well, if you come over to the North Carolina side, you've got a lot more elevation. So there's a lot more painted trillium in North Carolina that you should be able to find. Um, Devil's Courthouse is a great place to go see these for sure. Also, the shut-in trail. Shut oh, yeah, the shut-in trail. Yeah, yeah. Um, coming between Cherokee and Gatlinburg. Can't remember the name of that road. Four something another. You're on your way up to... Before, there you go. Before you get up to the gap up there, there's... Um, 
Uh, left hand side, last trail on the left, great place. There's Catesby's trilliums, there's painted trilliums, and a whole gob of other things. It's spectacular. So our painted trim, beautiful. Once again, painted. What's the purpose of that? Let's track the pollinator. Remember I said there's that nice white coloration, but it turns out that if you are somewhere in the blue range, which pink happens to have some blue in it, I understand, um, that lets you know it's insect pollinated. Insects see on the blue end of the spectrum. They don't see on the red end. But that's another talk. Uh, the large flowered trillium, Trillium grandiflorum, the name says it right there for you. Nice white coloration in here. You can see the pollen inside of here. Follow it down, it would have sort of a, uh, a light yellowish to whitish bloom. Notice how the petals also overlap, almost creating a vase shape to it. So you don't have spacing through there. It's overlapped much more than our other species that we've seen so far. The large flower trillium. It's light colored as well. You can kind of tell in here, sort of yellowish colored, uh, yellowish to, to greeny. Uh, they'll get nice where they do grow. You'll get nice little uh, populations like this. And once again, you know, the seed falls off. Here you go. Seed falls off. There you go. And here's lots of young ones. Look at there. Lots of little bit of young ones down in there. Um, also, oh, look at here. Here's a. Uh, Oh, I won't do that. Where's, where's Waldo? <laughs> That's a violet talk. I'll tell you about that one later. But there's violets down there. All right. Now, this one is really cool. Uh, Dr. Patrick out of, um, he's over in the Georgia area. He works for the state of Georgia. Dr. Patrick is one of the leading experts trillium in the southeast. Matter of fact, he's one of the leading experts on trillium in, in the world. Well, he found this nice little species growing up in the, in the Great Smoky Mountains. It's a beautiful, beautiful plant. And it's really beautiful when you look on the inside. Look at that. The first time I saw this thing, I looked and I thought, well, it's hollow in the middle. But it's not. It's, just, it's actually sort of a white coloration. But it's got, along the edges, look at that dark burgundy ovary in there. You've got all your stamen in there, nice ovaries. Um, Beautiful. If you go to Gatlinburg, everybody's favorite place, right? <laughs> Gatlinburg. Um, over you go to Ober Gatlinburg, you can go to the Moonshine Distillery place. They've got lots of those down there. I was there last year. Everywhere there's there are moonshine places. Um, but of course you want to ride the trolley if you're going there. You don't want to drive. So go to the trolley station. While you're at the trolley station, walk down near the creek and look down near the creek and you'll see these things blooming. Yeah. This is the Southern Nodding Trillium. Okay. Uh, our largest flowering trillium, this is Bassi's trillium or trillium Bassii. Huge, huge flowers on these. Um, they usually glow single. Notice the, I showed you the grand florum, there was a large bouquet or bunch of them. These typically grow single. You'll have one plant and you'll have another and then you'll have another. Um, if you go to Jones Gap around April 17th or so, um, the camping road, they'll be on your left on the hillside. Great place to see those. They're also all up that trail. Um, um, I don't think they're at Pearson's Falls. I've looked at Pearson's Falls. I've looked at the species list, but I don't think it's there. Um, but it's also over on the Tatuga River. Um, I think it's on the shut-in trail as well. Uh, so on the trail over on Grandfather Mountain. What's the one on Grandfather that you... You know the one I'm talking about? Grandfather Mountain, there's a... Yeah, you don't have to pay to go into that one as you pull off and you do that trail. But anyways, great wildflower trail. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, I think it's on that one. Sorry, I, I lost my train of thought of where it was. Uh, but look at that, isn't it beautiful? Once again, it's got that nice pedestal hanging down, letting you know that it's a nodding trillium. What yes. Yeah. Yeah. Three inches, three inches plus. Yeah, they're big. Um, sweet white trillium. Notice sweet white trillium has a dark center, whereas our grandiflorum had a yellow to greenish center. This is sweet white trillium. Uh, Pam, as you guys head back toward the waterfall at Station Cove, mm -hmm. once you cross over the creek. There should be some in there. 
Uh, they also are at Pearson's Falls. You have uh, sweet white trillium growing there as well. Um, and I look back at my notes. On one of the packed properties has a, all those white ones. Is that simile or is it Childers? Children. It's great white. I thought, yeah, I thought it was sweet white. Yeah, Childers, um, one of the uh, packed protected pieces of property um, between going your way to between Tryon and Saluda. Incredible place. If, uh, I don't know if, if you guys get to go there or not, but beautiful, beautiful place um, to, to be able to see the sweet white trilliums. But notice it's going to have white. But also notice that the petals don't overlap as much as they did in the Grandiflorum, and you don't quite have that sort of vase shape to it, and it's got that dark ovary in the middle. How about this one? Red trillium. Good name for it, right? Yeah. You can really see the sepals behind back in here. They're not covered up at all. But this one kind of looks like it too, doesn't it? That's because that too is red trillium. <laughs> trillium erectum, trillium erectum, trillium erectum. Red, white. But there again, if you look at that ovary in there, nice dark ovary in there, you're going to have more like uh, your stamen are going to be yellowish in color. You're going to get yellow pollen in there. Um, you're going to be able to see those bracts behind it. You're not going to have that overlapping. So a lot of spacing between uh, your petals or sepals. Um, so color doesn't always help. Nope. You have a mix. And I, this, these were taken in the Smokies on, um, uh, if you're going to Klingman's Dome, but as soon as you get off Klingman's Dome, it's the first pull off on the right. I think it's called Indian Gap Trail. It's part of the Appalachian Trail. Incredible trail, but that's where these were. Matter of fact, you didn't even have to walk a trail. Just get out of your car, and there's an apple tree, and they're everywhere underneath there. Hundreds of them. Hundreds of them. They grow together? Oh, yeah, same. Right beside each other. Big, huge clusters of them right beside each other. Some will be red, some will be white. Oh, April 15th? <laughs> <laughs> no, this was actually the last week of April. Okay. The last week of April. Because you're up about 6,000 feet, so, yeah. So, yeah. So, great. Trilliums of the Carolinas.